what I've tried to do is, um, is, is really just to pick out some key trends as I see them, relate them back to the, the property market, the investment market and the occupational market, um, give you guys some food for thought um, to, to quiz our expert panellists who can then delve into the detail, look what's actually going on, the deal makers, so on and so forth. Um, so really that was just a bit of a shameless self-promotion on the first slide, um, but it's really just so you've got my contact details. Um, the slides will all be made available to you, and uh, just so you know, you know the, the Savills network across Europe is, uh, is increasing, and we're you know, in starting to focus uh, a little bit more on logistics as we go. So, megatrends. Um, what I thought I would do is, is just pick out a few ideas. We as Savills on the, the European research team um, we've been launching a, a series of papers recently called, called European Megatrends. And, and the idea behind them is that they're looking at, at demographics, at technology, at structural changes in, in, uh, in I guess, in, in life in general, and how they impact on, on commercial property markets, both the occupational and investment. Uh, we launched these last year, um, and, and, uh, and we did a second paper on the retail market. Now, the retail market at the back end of 2015, this paper had some profound implications for European supply chains moving forward. Some of the trends we were picking out, the future of click and collect, the future of, uh, of online retail, the future of the high street, um, all of these have, have big implications in, in European logistics, cross-border investment, cross-border logistics flows, cross-border trade. Um, so the obvious place to take this was a, a megatrends paper on, on European logistics and its, and its impact on, on uh, sorry, um, and its impact on property. So what I thought I'd do is I'd give you a bit of a sneak preview um, of a paper we're going to launch at MIPIM and just pick out some of the key, key highlights really from that. <clears throat> Those who have seen me present before will know that this is one of my favourite slides. Um, I've used this a lot recently and, and you know, it tells a big story. Logistics Manager, a trade magazine here in the UK, um, published an article fairly recently um, which was a Forbes 500 survey uh, conducted by PwC. Um, and it said that only 17% of retail chief executives believe their supply chains are, are optimal. Um, which, is, which is astonishing, really, in the omni-channel world that we find ourselves in, uh, in these days. Uh, disruption in retail is, is the new normal. Um, those who win in logistics will win in retail. Um, the chief executive of John Lewis said that the reason they are doing well is because of their supply chains. Um, I'm going to come on to the John Lewis story and a few other ideas uh, as we go. And I've borrowed this from Prologis. What drives demand for logistics real estate? Well, it's, it's threefold, really. It's, it's global trade, it's consumption, and it's structural change. Uh, structural change in retail markets, structural change in consumer markets. So what I'll do is just pick out some of those, um, those trends, and then we'll talk about the economic piece, and then we'll relate it all back to property as we go. A few of us in the room uh, were lucky enough to, to go around John Lewis's distribution centre in, um, in Milton Keynes yesterday. Uh, we were invited by John Lewis to see what they had done to this building. Um, they took one unit of 600,000 square feet uh, in 2008. They forecast that that one unit would see them through in terms of their store demand and their online demand for the next 10 years. Since that, they've taken that unit, they've since taken an addi additional three units on the same campus. They've created an omni-channel logistics campus that is effectively the backbone of what they're doing. The building itself, the envelope, cost £20 million maybe. Um, the fit-out in there is, is approxi approximately £200 million. We were in there yesterday. The conveyor belts, the automation, the, 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 the flow of product is astonishing. Within 15 minutes of your order being picked, sorry, being paid for on johnlewis.com, it, it is on a conveyor belt and being shipped across Europe. Um, this is, you know, it is an astonishing, uh, astonishing supply chain. Um, and all of this has an impact. And this cartoon I've taken from Cap Gemini. And all it does really is it illustrate how complex, how global, how integrated supply chains are. And, and the people who will win in logistics moving forward are going to be the companies, the retailers who get this and, and implement their, their supply chains accordingly. The key thing also 
is that we as consumers want our product where we want it. We want it when we want it. We want it in our homes. We want it in our offices. Um, Amazon are beginning to talk about delivering to wherever you are because they know where you are uh, via your iPhone GPS. Again, this has, has huge implications moving forward. As I was researching this, uh, this presentation, uh, I, was, uh, I started following Major Tim Peake, the, uh, the astronaut uh, who's up on the space station at the moment. Um, one of the trends that I, uh, I was uh, uh, drawing out is the impact of urbanization and how that will impact logistics uh, moving forward. Um, and actually, he took this as the International Space Station uh, flew over London. Um, and it's, uh, it just you know, hammered home to me, really, how, 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 how urbanized London is, how urbanized the UK is. And, and this is not just a trend in, 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 uh, in the UK and London. This is across Europe. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in 2015, 54% of, uh, of, of the global population is, is living in an urban <laughs> location. Um, fast forward to 2050, and we're talking about 66% of the population being in an urban population. I know there's some people from Seagro in the room who've been talking about urban logistics, last mile delivery, um, the need for more, uh, more, more space closer to people. Um, however, there, there needs to be a balance, there needs to be a, a, a realisation that the, the supply chain required to go with this urbanisation um, needs to be developed. And actually, you know, I think we're at the cusp, um, I know there's the, the people from Seagro in the room, I think we're at the, you know, the cusp of effectively the creation of a new asset class within the, the property market for the, the last mile parcel delivery operator. Um, I was with the chief executive of a, a trade body recently, the UK Warehousing Association. Um, in the UK, and I guess across Europe as well, with this urbanisation trend, um, we're talking about residential development all the time. Um, new homes, uh, new, new places for people to live. Um, in the UK, we're talking about 400,000 uh, new homes. You know, uh, this is a political aspiration. Well, the chief executive of the UK Warehousing Association said to me, well, 400,000 new homes is for also 400,000 new delivery addresses. How are we going to service these people? If we all want our, our, our orders here, now, or wherever, we need the supply chain to go around this. Um, and interestingly, I think developers and investors are beginning to, uh, to realise this as well. I've been speaking to a number of people uh, client on our, in our client base, both on the developer side and the investor side, talking about um, almost logistics and, and residential development cohabiting, a new form of, of development. And actually, I worked on a, on a, on a planning application recently um, up in North London, where you have an actual uh, mixed use uh, with, with residential on the top and, and logistics on the bottom. Now, this is all quite interesting. Also, you know, how, uh, I guess, how high do land values have to get um, for, for double-decker warehousing to be, to be the norm again? We're, we're hearing rumours that this is going to um, come forward again in the UK. Again, I think it's a very wise use of space. We have to think about the intensification of the cube if our, our planners, if our political masters are having this focus on, on residential development. We have to address uh, the issue of supply chains as well. Amazon Prime Now, um, a game changer, in my opinion, for, for logistics. Um, for those of you who haven't used Amazon Prime Now, I'll, I'll talk you through something uh, in a moment. But effectively, what this allows you uh, allows is is delivery of products within an hour window, depending on where you are. They launched this in the UK last year. Um, Amazon, uh, just by way of context, accounted for 10% of the UK logistics market in 2015. 10% of all units over 100,000 square feet were let to Amazon. Uh, we were with Amazon recently. They estimate they're going to do the same in 2016 in the UK. Why is this? It's because we all want our product here and now. Um, what I thought I'd do, I, I was half tempted to, to have my iPhone with me uh, and make an Amazon Prime order now uh, and, and, and have it delivered. Um, but I thought it was a bit risky. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd just talk you through something that I, I did fairly recently. Um, I, so I was flicking through the Amazon Prime Now app on my iPhone and I had a £10 uh, discount offer. So I thought, right, I'll use this. This is a, a, bit, of, uh, a bit of live research. Uh, and 
I ordered um, some new earphones for my iPhone. Uh, I ordered some cod liver oil. I've got, got bad joints. Um, and I ordered a radiator key uh, because the, I needed to bleed my radiators because they weren't quite working properly. Those three items, the radiator key cost 69 pence. Uh, anyway, I, I did place this order. Within 15 minutes, um, I got a, a, a text um, saying my order's on the way from a warehouse in East London. Um, I could then follow it through London like, a, like an Uber. And then uh, a nice gentleman turned up outside the building, just, just here, uh, with my, my cod liver oil, my earphones, and my, um, and my radiator key. I got a text, and then there, there's the uh, product on my desk. Now, the key thing with this, really, is that um, it's game-changing. It's, 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 uh, it's changing retail. It's changing habits. Um, I could have walked to, to Boots uh, and Maplin and Curry's, which are all within five minutes of this office, and picked up all of that. Um, I don't have to. Uh, it was part of my Amazon Prime subscription. I think it's a game changer. And, and, and the key thing for logistics markets is how retailers are going to adapt to this threat. Um, Amazon Prime now is going to launch in, in, it has launched in Italy. They're talking about Germany. Um, we've seen the press in the UK about um, Argos and Sainsbury's. Um, in my opinion, I think it's a masterstroke from Sainsbury's because what Sainsbury's are going to be buying is the Argos delivery network, which is effectively a competitor to Amazon Prime now. What it will allow is, is for non-food deliveries to be made within Argos's four-hour uh, delivery slots. If you order by 7 p.m., you can get it the same night. Crucially, as well, what it will also allow is Sainsbury's to access the Argos delivery infrastructure for grocery retail. Now, there's a huge amount of supply chain infrastructure to, that needs to go behind that, but it is one of the ideas that is making this uh, an interesting uh, proposition. So the key thing across Europe, then, is, is how other retailers react to this threat. It's also, um, it's also what Amazon decide to do. Um, Amazon... You know, if you read the, the, the city rumours, again, I thought to be weighing up a bid for Ocado here in the UK into, into fresh food and, and grocery delivery. And also, Amazon haven't really um, dipped its toe into clothing retail as well. You know, they dabble a bit on the side. Uh, but if and when Amazon decides to do that, how will that affect ASOS? How will that affect Next? How will that affect uh, Topman just on the corner here, Topshop just on the corner? All of this has, has huge ramifications for, for global logistics real estate and the investments that, um, that we are then making as a result of this. What Amazon requires, though, for this is a, an infrastructure. It needs, it needs urbanized, an urbanized environment, which it has in Europe, as I've, as, as I've shown, and also what it requires is the network infrastructure. Now, I don't really buy into the, the story about drones uh, that Amazon uh, are talking about. I think that's, that's good PR. Um, but what it does require is a good, a good road network, a good air network, um, and you know uh, I think yeah, it's well documented. But just a nod to what's going on, you know, in terms of development, port infrastructure, uh, multimodal corridors, and, and so on, all will have an impact in, in future European logistics hotspots. Um, again, I'll just draw your attention to this: driverless vehicles. Um, DHL have done a really interesting report, which you can download from their website, about the impact of, of driverless vehicles. Um, this, I think, is more relevant and more pertinent to, to us, everyone in this room. Um, within the length of a lease, within the length of a 15-year lease, DHL are estimating that there will be driverless vehicles, driverless trucks, on the roads of Europe. So how does that impact you as an investor? Um, well, if you strip out the, the European Working Time Directive for driver's hours, how does that change the centre of gravity in terms of distribution? Um, in the UK alone, you know, will it make the Golden Triangle obsolete? Um, should I locate my uh, distribution centre in, in, in Scotland, in Wales, where, the, where land and labour uh, is plentiful, uh, and, then, and then drive in? Does it, does it change things? Um, within the length, as I say, within the length of a lease, these are issues that we're going to have to address. Uh, as an industry, um, so just one to flag, really. So <clears throat> that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of those mega trends um, uh, that we're drawing out of the market at the moment. And what does this all mean for property? Well, 
if you remember the slide I put up at the beginning from Prologis, um, which was the, uh, the economic drivers, um, I've taken these economic forecasts for, for GDP growth across Europe. And what you can see there in 2016, 2017, all showing positive growth, all showing increases in consumption, all showing increases in demand, which will drive demand for logistics real estate uh, as we go. Interestingly, Prologis released their results recently, um, just after um, about two weeks ago, a 2.9% vacancy rate in their European portfolio of, 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 uh, of logistics space, more required as we go. And also, all of that structural change has effectively meant that logistics is now regarded as a global asset class. Uh, this was from the InRev Investor Intentions uh, Survey. 88.9% of fund managers uh, said it's their favorite sector, which uh, I guess is good news for me because it's going to hopefully keep me in the job. Um, but it's, uh, you know, this is here to stay. The structural trend uh, is, is, is there, it is real, it is happening. So what does this mean for investment volumes? Well, I've taken these numbers from RCA, um, and this is just for distribution. I've, I've stripped out the industrial side of things uh, for the purposes of this seminar. Um, but you're seeing, I think, a new normal in terms of where investment volumes are heading. Um, between 10 and 12 billion euros invested in the sector a year. If you then add in you know, the, the multi-let side of things, the, um, the last mile delivery, the smaller uh, multi-occupied uh, units, you know, this, this, this almost doubles, you know, 20 billion pounds worth of investment in the sector. Um, so you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sector that means business. Now, one point which I'll be uh, interested to pick the brains of the panel on um, is you know, we've seen this slight drop off in, in, vol in volumes in 2015. Is that driven by developers, uh, Prologis, uh, Goodman, Gaisley, um, being developer holders instead of developer traders, are, are people holding stock? Is it trading? Um, so that's a quite you know a question that we can uh, we can put forward. Um, and then I thought what would be interesting to look at as well is in the environment that we now find ourselves in on the investment market, looking for higher returns, uh, risk and reward. Um, has the balance of capital changed? You know, where is the capital heading in in Europe? Um, I saw saw some research recently that said you know by rights. Uh, you know, investors should be looking at, at emerging markets where there's going to be a lot of growth in, uh, in online retail, where there's going to be a lot of economic growth. Um, but actually what we're still seeing really is if you look at 2012 and, and 2015, the proportion of capital flows haven't really changed much. And again, um, we were talking about this just before the presentation with my, uh, with my colleague Ingo from, uh, from Berlin. And is it, um, you know, is it, is it about the, the transparency of the market? Is it, about, is it about the ease of doing business in the market? Um, you know, why have those balance of capital not, not changed, uh, you know, over the last two, three years when the structural change within the market is so apparent? So, you know, a couple of thoughts to set the scene. Lastly, we did a piece of work um, in 2015, and what we wanted to do was just try to quite quantify what was going on in the markets and what the impact of online retail would be. Prologis did some, um, some, some quite interesting research, which I'm sure you know, most of you will have seen, um, that says for every extra uh, billion pounds spent online requires um, an extra 775,000 square feet. Um, depending on which forecast you buy in for, uh, for your, your European uh, online in, uh, retail volumes will depend on you know, how you view this. But just taking a, a forecast from Forrester, um, sales set to rise by 233 billion in the next four years. Well, that to me means there's an, an extra 94 million square feet of property required by 2020, which is you know, an astonishing amount of uh, take up. We had 20 million square feet, uh, sorry, 24 million square feet transacted in the UK alone in, uh, in 2015. And remember, 10% of that, 2.4 million square feet just to Amazon. And again, this is playing out. This was a story on, uh, on Property EU just last night. Uh, Good, Goodman developing a, a new unit for Zalando in Germany. Um, the key point that I drew out of that, and again, tying in with uh, the work that we did, um, almost 16 million square feet currently in the Goodman development pipeline for e-commerce alone. Um, again, astonishing numbers, huge numbers. Uh, huge amounts of uh, space transacted huge amount of, of forward fundings, investment, lot to go at. So, to wrap up, really, um, the points I'm making here is that the, the structural change that we've seen in the UK is, uh, is going to accelerate into Europe. 
Uh, if you read any of the analyst reports on, on online retail, where it's heading, um, the UK is effectively at the bleeding edge of, of this technology, and this will increase in Europe as we go. Uh, some of the deals there that, that you've seen. Watch Amazon, watch what they do with interest, because whatever they do, other retailers will follow. Um, it really is as simple as that. We've seen it in the UK. I think you're going to see a lot of M&A in the sector as a result of what Amazon are going to do. Um, I haven't really mentioned manufacturing. I just want to draw out one point really here. Um, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, uh, a real success story in the UK. Um, we saw um, in the UK the investment that Jaguar Land Rover made in, 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 in Birmingham, in Coventry, in the centre of the UK, in their manufacturing facilities, had a huge impact on logistics as we know it. So it's not just about the manufacturing piece, it's about the supply chain that follows. In the West Midlands, take up in the logistics sector related to the automotive sector increased from 5% of the market in 2011 to 54% of the market in 2015. So where you get these huge investments in, in the automotive supply chain, in automotive manufacturing, um, you will see the ripple effect across the logistics market as well.